This is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. Hello and welcome to Walk the Talk. I am Shekhar Gupta and let me tell you one fact about my guest this week. In 142 years, only eight Indians have been elected as fellows of America's National Academy of Sciences. It's an honor that considered only next to the Nobel. He got it in 2005 after many decades of hard work. Today, Dr. Raghunath Anand Mashelkar leads what is perhaps one of the largest government scientific establishments in the world. 16,000 or more than 60,000 scientists and technicians. Dr. Mashelkar, a very inspiring right. presence and a very special privilege to welcome you and walk the Thank talk. you. Thank you, Shekhar. And Thank that you. too in your alma mater, the National Chemical Lab in Pune. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here in this lab. Came here in 1976, uh, right. almost uh, three decades ago as a young man. Right. So wonderful to be uh, standing here. Today. And I believe you still keep coming, coming back here whenever you find a time to continue with your research. Yes, uh, science is my first love. And uh, although I'm in Delhi, I do come during the weekends to spend time with my students and uh, with my uh, colleagues. I keep active. It's extremely important. And, and your, in your radiation-filled labs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a, a high-resolution solid-state NMR lab. Yes. Yeah, so, so, uh, we, we, we've been warned about the effects it might have on <laughs> right. our microphones and cameras <laughs> and tape. But Dr. Mashilka, before we get into your uh, the life in, in your labs, uh, let me take you back to your childhood. You know, you've had very humble beginnings. You, you've written very touchingly about your very tough childhood, the death of your father at the age when you were six, yeah. uh, the troubles your mother had bringing you up, even the fact that you had to borrow money from a housemate to pay for your education. Yes, yes. It was uh, 21 rupees that we needed and uh, we had to go to a housemate who was working at Chaupati in Bombay uh, to get it. And finally, I managed to get uh, uh, admission in high school. And you know, very importantly, that was her saving and she gave it to us at that point in time, telling my mother that your son must study. I mean, it was amazing time. Yes, amazing time. But all, all the times have got equalized a bit now because I think opportunity is a bit better for uh, for children from humble backgrounds. Indeed, India, India has changed. Indeed, as a matter of fact, I'm very proud to say I went to a municipal school, Marathi High School, and uh, it was a government-aided school, as a matter of fact. And that primary education would not have been possible if it was not free. And scores of such children today get an opportunity, and. Uh, it was so, uh, actually a scholarship that I had uh, from Tata, you know, just 60 rupees per month, which allowed me to actually uh, not leave school, I mean, uh, go to college uh, after I had done my SSC. Yes. But, but life has become uh, more of a level playing field for, for people that I describe as, people like us, people I describe as HMTs, the Hindi medium type. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I, yes, I was an MMT, Marathi medium type, but <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yes. Right. Uh, yeah. In fact, I was speaking uh, at one of the uh, big functions at Infosys and I, on an impulse, I asked the audience, which is all the Infosys engineers, uh, how many of them came from English medium schools. And it's very it was very surprising, pleasantly surprising, to see how few hands went up. Oh, really? That means yeah. real India or Bharat is doing all right. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I believe that is where we need to really uh, worry about. I mean, 50% children go to school, about 30% of them go up to 10th standard, 40% pass. We are talking about 6% children who right. go beyond 10th standard. So it is a kind of a tip of the iceberg. The rest of the iceberg is submerged. Right. And I think our biggest challenge is how do we lift that iceberg, you know, right. where Mashelkars resided at one point in time. Right. I and, think and, that and, is... And, and, and to give them an environment yes. where it's not so vital anymore that your parents should have done very well in life. Indeed, indeed. And you see scores of such examples of young people coming up who have been given an opportunity. I think the essential issue, Shekhar, is an opportunity in life to sort of go ahead, like the scholarship that I got, uh, like the subsequent opportunities uh, that I got. You know, even when I went abroad, for example, the way I was brought back, is very interesting. Doctor, Mrs. Gandhi, I believe, told Dr. Naidoma to search for somebody and he found you and he said, no application, no certificates, just come with me. Yes, it was an unbelievable time. In fact, Mrs. Gandhi was really concerned that uh, Harpan Skorana, who got Nobel Prize, right. actually came here 
and could not uh, get a job. So she said to Dr. Nayaduma, who was my predecessor, the Director General. This is Hargobind Khurana who worked on uh, DNA. Yes, absolutely. Wisconsin. Uh, uh, right. uh, uh, yeah. And, uh, um, you know, she simply said, you just go, spot the brightest and offer them job on the spot. That so, is how I, so, so I did not know that, no, did not know that she was spurred into this by Hargobind Khurana's Nobel. Yes, at that time there was a lot of discussion right. as to why people, young people have to struggle basically with all these applications and wait and interviews and this, that and the other. Why don't we do this? So Mrs. Gandhi in 74, who was beginning to swear by socialism, was yes. willing to bend all rules, so to say, yes. or short circuit them yes. to spot talent. Yes, yes. Indeed. And she trusted Dr. Nayaduma right. and his judgment. I remember his uh, coming to Seva Hotel in London. I just went, talked to him for half an hour. And uh, he filled me with the dream of the new India, you know. And on the spot I accepted. Somehow or the other, I'm a very intuitive person. I think from here, not from here. And in the evening, I phoned up my wife and I said, nation is calling us, let's go back. And I came on a salary of 2,100 rupees. And Shekhar, times were very tough then, 1976. In this life, I still remember coming and uh, struggling to get a gas cylinder. Right. Yeah, my wife cooked on kerosene stove at that point in time. Uh, I uh, remember uh, applying for a Bajaj scooter, 3,500 rupees, and uh, waited for, uh, what, five to six years. And this lab produces more chemistry PhDs than almost any place in the world, I believe. Absolutely. Right? Young people, I mean, there are more than 450 research scholars who do their PhDs here in, in, in National Chemical right. uh, Laboratory. But, you know, going back to those times, those times and now, it's very different. I remember at that point in uh, time, if one talked about 128K, it was a big memory for a computer. Right, right. Now today we talk about gigaflops and teraflops. This library that you are seeing, I still remember, the journals used to come here by sea mail. Right. It used to take four months for the journals to come here. All right. Today, I have 3,000 e-journals for our uh, student, uh, our, for, uh, for, for our... Uh, but you know, Dr. Member. Mashilkar, on the flip side, mm. there are many research universities in India, particularly agriculture universities, mm. which have, which spend 110, 120 percent of their budget just on salaries and establishment and have no money for journals or research. In fact, in many cases, you would find that their subscri subscriptions for journals have lapsed. I believe that our university system is in dire trouble, particularly the state universities. Central universities are doing reasonably okay. Uh, in fact, there is hardly any money uh, for development today. And I do personally believe that unless our universities are resurrected right. in a major way, right. India has no hope. Right. And uh, you've been working on some of that. I think, I think you've been associate, associated with some work on ICAR. Uh, Sharad yes. Prabhat set up a committee to look at uh, yes, yes. Indian Council of Agriculture Research. Right. Uh, we thought agriculture is very critical for India, you know, and you know the good work that they have done in the past. But we found that that system needed huge reform. So there was a committee under my chairmanship. It's yeah. become hugely bureaucratic. It has, and uh, you know, we have suggested large number of reforms. Why should there be a director general and a director, and in between? so many deputy director generals and right. additional director right. generals and so on. Right. And I do believe that uh, Mr. Sharad Pawar is looking at this report to see how that entire system can be reformed. Yes. Right. But when you took over CSIR, tell me a bit about it. I believe this was as bad as ICAR. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it like this. We, we were in trouble, to be honest. We had 40 laboratories, but they behaved like 40 laboratories. There was nothing like Team CSIR. Uh, strong trade unions, so as to say. You know, my director, National uh, Environmental Engineering Research Institute, Neeri Nagpur, would phone me up, said there are 100 people in my room, speak to them. We would have laboratories where directors would be locked up practically, you know, not being allowed even uh, for them to go to a washroom and so on, so forth, etc. And I said, no. Science is not labor. And I they believe you held board meetings in boardrooms which had slogans painted on the walls inside. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. All that is gone now because we have now a very transparent you, you, open system.